I had always kind of hated on dance music before that because it was always like, to me, and the way I perceived it at the time was just kind of boring, you know, like, doom, 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 doom. You have your first kid and they're on their way and as, for me, I was just, I didn't know what to do. You know, like, what do I, how am I gonna support this family? Either I need to go back to school and like learn like a, a craft and get a job, a career, doing something else, or I give it another shot with music. We kind of came to the consensus that I didn't want to get old and look back and be like, I really wish I had tried one more time. Hi, this is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk. Today I'm here with Rosa Fari. What's up? <laughs> so you're actually one of the first people I listened to, like electronic music as a whole. Okay. Like really? five, six years ago, yeah, with that ass. <laughs> really? Yes. And so That's I'm funny. like, this is like really full circle. Like okay. I'm interviewing people that I've always like listened to, like when I first started listening to music. So this awesome. is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Nobody's brought that song up for Really? I would thought everyone would be like, oh, that's the song I found. I guess because a lot of fans I, are new. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, was, I was talking to a buddy of mine about that earlier, about how I, I'm having a hard time lately, like figuring out who is new in the fan base. You know what I mean? Oh, like, that's interesting. So when I play shows, I'm not sure if I should be playing things that I made, you know, that's so six, seven years ago still, because it feels to me like it's not fresh anymore, but mm -hmm. whatever. I still want to hear that song live, but. So you were born originally in Rome, right? I was, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all your family's like Italian or? No, I mean, uh, my mom's actually born in America. Um, my dad was born in Yugoslavia. They were just living there at the time. They were there for, I think, I don't remember. I don't want to. I don't want to say the wrong thing, and then one of my siblings or my parents yell at me about <laughs> it. But um, yeah, I, I, we came to the states when I was I was still a baby. I was I think I was like six months old. So for your I, I, job, just opportunity. I think I think they were just ready for a change. Um, all my my brothers were in their teens. Uh, my sisters like five or six. I think they just wanted to bring him to the states and you know expose him to different education, different culture. I don't know. What careers were they in? Uh, my, my, my dad's retired. He retired quite a while ago. He did air purification. Okay. <laughs> he actually, it's really cool. He did, uh, air, he had a company that did air purification for, uh, the Sistine Chapel. Wow. Yeah, and a bunch of other really, really significant places. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And your mom? Cool. My mom was a, a mom. <laughs> a, yeah, she was just a stay-at-home mom. She raised all of us. Where do you think I your creative side from? Uh, <clears throat> my dad's a painter. Oh wow. Um, his mother was a painter. Uh, my uncle, his brother, is a piano player. So I, you know, it's just I'm gonna guess it runs in my dad's side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but I feel of, like I'm yeah. more like my mom. That's the thing. I get the creativity from my dad, but I, I think I'm more like my mother <laughs> in terms of personality. What kind of music were they playing in the house when you were growing up? Not much, honestly. I I, um, I was exposed to music by my sister. Oh, okay. Because when I was, I mean, I don't, I don't remember how old I was, but she was really into punk rock. So she was always playing Fugazi, Dead Kennedys, Black Flag. But didn't your mom kind of like ban you from listening because of the cover, the Dead Kennedys? Yeah, yeah. Wow, <laughs> you did your research. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first cassette tape I ever bought was Dead Kennedys and she didn't like the cover and made me return it, and then um, I think I replaced it with Guns N' Roses, which was way worse <laughs> in terms of like messaging to a young kid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> How old were you at this point? I want to say I was like 10? Oh. 11? I, I could be a little bit off, but I, I, was, I was really young. Mm -hmm. I was listening to stuff that nobody else was listening to like in my like my friends my circle of mm -hmm. friends and stuff so how else would you describe yourself back then growing up <laughs> i was in a sports i mean i was a totally normal kid i mean once i found music it definitely like i i lost interest in sports and things of that nature i just stayed in my room and just practiced playing guitar and writing really really bad punk songs <laughs> honestly yeah and you were in a band with fever high school yeah, I started a band in middle school. We just did like, I think, Green Day covers, <laughs> things like that. And then, um, yeah, I, I started taking it seriously in high school. I, I had played in a couple bands, played in a ska band in Atlanta. And uh, we, we played out pretty frequently, honestly. We played a lot of shows. Did you think that you could do music as a career from the onset? 
No, um, but I also didn't think about it. You know, I, I was just literally learning my craft. It, you know, I wasn't thinking about the fact that I was learning how to be a musician, but it was all 100% in the moment. Um, and I just loved punk rock so much that when I finally found a drummer and somebody who could play bass, I was, I, I didn't put any thought into like, wow, this is what I'm gonna do when I get older. I obviously, I idolized a lot of musicians and I'm sure I had, you know, <clears throat> aspirations and dreams of being on stage um, pretty early on, but I never thought, I don't think I thought like, what am I gonna do when I'm 40 years old? You know, it yeah. never like really entered into my mind. So you didn't really like school? Uh, no, yeah. I didn't. I wasn't bad though. I mean, I had I had a couple years where I was, I actually dropped out of high school at one point. <laughs> I, yeah, I had a couple bad years in high school, but then I went back and I, I was like an honor roll student and oh, I wow. finished okay. out high school, you know, just under a 4.0 GPA. Mm -hmm. So I got my shit together. <laughs> um, so your parents weren't worried? No. Well, they were at one point, obviously, when I dropped out, but when I, I you know, I, I don't want to get too personal about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I wound up going back because of them and how disappointed they were. And mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. I started feeling kind of like I was, I don't know, I, I felt like a, a bit of a, I don't want to say I was, felt like a loser, but you know, all my friends were still in school and I was like missing out on the social oh, aspect yeah. of it. And I don't know, I just, I, I felt like I could, I, I was letting myself down a little bit. So I went back just gave it everything and did well and then went off to college. What did he study in college? Nothing. <laughs> That's when I found DJing. And, um, With like, what's his name, Giganator? Giganator? G Gigantor. G Gigantor. Gigantor, yeah. Yeah, he was the, uh, one of the first people I met. Um, he taught me pretty much everything I, I knew at the beginning in terms of production. He, uh, he worked at a radio station where I went to school in Alabama. And, you know, we just immediately became friends and started writing songs and we were both really into drum and bass and that's what we did. I mean, I, I, I made drum and bass from that point on for like mm -hmm. 10 years, I think. What band was it? Because I was reading a previous interview that like one of the lead singers was trying to make himself throw up on stage and that just like, oh, that that was, just stuck uh, in my head. Oh, that was in high school. I okay. can't believe I talked about that. <laughs> I was like, that it was just so stuck in my head. How did I talk? When did I talk about that? Um, <laughs> yeah, that was my friend Danny. <laughs> Hi, Danny. Uh, yeah, that was my, my ska band, punk ska band in high school called Go For Broke. Mm -hmm. And if you can find that online, Good for you. I, I, I can't even find it. Last time I looked for it, I couldn't find any of the songs. <laughs> then you got more and more into drum and bass. After. Yeah, uh, from like 1998 till I don't know when. I mean, I'm still into drum and bass. I still love it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Evil Intent was the name of the group. Yeah. It was me and Gigantor and a guy from Oklahoma at the time, Oklahoma, named The Enemy. And he's now known as Treasure Fingers. House oh, Bruiser. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we started doing that and it took off like way, way quicker than we all thought it would. Um, in America at that time, like around 2000, 2001, there was not much of a place for uh, drum and bass producers and DJs from the US yeah. to kind of make it internationally. And drum and bass was a big like international scene. So we were kind of shunned at first, but I think you know we were making good music, and we eventually linked up with a label in the UK, and they just kind of put some faith into us, and it just started working out, and we started getting booked, and that was it. Yeah. And before that, they did like electronic music never cross your mind? Or, like, what was that transition like? Yeah, it was crazy because I um, basically I found myself at you know, in school or in college, playing guitar by myself, and I just couldn't find any bandmates. Like, I, I couldn't find anybody to play drums, couldn't find anybody to play bass, and that's when I went to a rave. <laughs> so, you know, like, it all it all just happened organically. Um, the first time I heard drum and bass, it was, I instantly liked it. I had always kind of hated on dance music before that because it was always, like, to me, and the way I perceived it at the time, it was just kind of boring, you know, like, doom, 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 doom. That's all it was to me at the time. But then, again, I heard drum and bass. Uh, DJ Diesel Boy was the first guy I ever heard play drum and bass. 
and I was hooked instantly. I put like everything into learning the craft of being you know, a DJ and learning how to make it. I bought a sampler and I just started learning how to cut up samples inside of it. Was it easy for you to transition into producing? Well, <clears throat> um, DJing came like really quickly for me. Just because the idea of you know matching two beats was pretty simple in my mind, but um, the production side definitely took a long time to wrap my head around it, and you know I'm still wrapping my head around it. You know I, I I've been doing this now, producing for almost 20 years, and I still you know every time I go in the studio, I'm trying to learn something new. So. Mm. And how did you get more into the Mumbaton? Mumbaton. Yeah. <laughs> um. It's actually a pretty good story. I um, I had been living in LA and just kind of not really doing much. Um, I wasn't. I was making a lot of music, whether it was drum and bass or trying to write some like indie rock type of stuff. And uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Uh, my my now wife got pregnant, and she lived in Texas. And I said. I'm just gonna leave LA because I'm paying too much money for rent. I'm not doing anything, so I went to Texas. And I thought, you know, like what? You have your first kid, and they're on their way. And as for me, I was just I didn't know what to do. You know, like what do I? How am I gonna support this family? Mm-hmm. And how am I going to you know put food on the table? How am I gonna you know, be a role model for this kid? I basically was presented with a situation where. I either had to make it happen or stop and go back to school or something because I was too young at the time to just wing it. You Were know? you in sophomore year or what? what no, no, no. This, this is when I was. This was eight, eight years ago. This was right before Movement Tone started. Oh, okay. but you were still in college. No, no, oh. no, 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 no. I'm, I'm an old man. <laughs> oh, I thought you were like, go back to school. You mean, I, yeah, no, well, I thought about it. That's what I'm saying. Oh, right, I basically, right. like, I had to figure it out. And I, I had this conversation with Heather, my wife. I said, you know, like, either I need to go back to school and, like, learn, like, a, a craft and get a job, a career, doing something else. Or... I give it another shot with music and and just try something new, start a new project. And I, we kind of came to the consensus that I didn't want to get old and look back and be like, I really wish I had tried one more time. Right around that time, I heard a Mumbaton track from Munchie. It was a remix of a Dad Sick song, I think, or something like that. And it just blew me away because it was so original and it kind of used drum and bass influences inside of it, so it made sense to me. So I was just like, I'm just gonna try to make some Moombatone stuff and see what happens. And I think Diplo and Dylan Francis were the first couple guys to get a hold of it. Um, Diplo put it, put my first song that I ever made, really, as Bro Safari, our first Moomba track. Uh, he wound up releasing it. On that decent. On, on the uh, side label, what's the name? Um, Jeffries. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, but regardless, you know, it gave me this huge boost in confidence, right? Like, I went from feeling like I was defeated and I had to start over to Diplo, who was, you know, the figurehead of the scene, supporting it and giving me giving me love on, on, on social media and this and that, so. That's kind of how it started with Movement Zone. From there, like, I, I was so early in, t- in it, you know, in the scene that, you know, it was, it was kind of easy to stand out because I had my own production style mm-hmm. and I put my own twist on it. So, yeah, it just kind of like organically came together. And how did you meet UFO? UFO is a legend. He's like, <laughs> he has been making insane music for much longer than I have. Like, he, when I first started DJing, he was already an established, uh, North American drum and bass producer. I used to play his records like before I even produced. You know what I mean? So I've known about him for 20 years, but um, he uh, he and I met, I think, when I was playing an Evil Intent gig in San Francisco, and he thought that I was somebody else or something. I remember him telling me, he's like, dude, you don't, you're not gonna believe this, but when we first met, I actually thought you were someone else. And when we exchanged <laughs> numbers, I thought you were blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, okay, well. But nevertheless, um, when I started making Moombatone, we connected online. I don't I don't remember exactly how, but I was like, what, do you, what have you been making? 
check this stuff out that I've been doing. He loved it. We just started collaborating, and like it, we made an EP. I think within like a week, um, a future primitive EP, and I loved it. It was original. Like nobody was making stuff like it. So I, we just, you know, ever since then, it's kind of like it's been an effortless collaborative process for us. How are you getting your music out there initially? I think I found some of your stuff through YouTube actually. SoundCloud. Um, I was yeah. there right, like right when I, that's another thing is, you know, with, with Bro Safari, like the stars kind of aligned for me in a sense because SoundCloud was new then mm -hmm. and I didn't have a manager or anything like that. So I just said, you know what? I think the best way for me to get my music out there is to just put it up online for free it, no strings attached, you know, like you don't have to click a link that this is before fan gating and all that mm -hmm. um, And that was it. I just started pushing it and I think people were so hungry for something new with the yeah. Mubatone stuff It sounded so different at that time. Yeah, exactly. I listen to it up. now and I cringe, but I mean Not Mubatone, but my shit <laughs> Like all of my early records I listened to them like they're so bad, but nevertheless at the time they weren't bad, you know, like people saw so something good. in it that yeah. they liked and yeah, it just kind of, it was, it was all organic, which is, I, I feel really lucky that I, I just, I started doing it when I did, you know? Mm -hmm. And then at what point did you realize that you, like, didn't want to keep doing Uh Well, I mean, I, never. I, you know, I still work on Moomatone. I put out a, a Moomba track, I think, last year. I, I've been working on one this last week. But I, I want to do something different with it, you know? I don't want to keep making the same thing. Because that's what happened with my previous projects. I just kind of got burnt out. Um, what about it? Like, you got burnt out from? Well, I think every producer has their own sound and style. And you kind of go through the motions at a certain point. After you, like, get your best work out, your best ideas, you put yourself in this box of, like, well, this is what, I, this is what works for me, so I'm just going to keep doing this. And I, um, I heard Trap music like I heard original Don remix from Flostradamus and I was like this is sick like I love this you know I, I lived in Atlanta for so long so I was already pretty in tune with trap music so to hear it with like you know cut up vocals and you know just dance music um, attributes I just instinctively started making trap and that just became what I did you know it wasn't like a conscious decision that of like all right I'm just gonna stop making Moomba and I'm gonna make trap now, but it's just kind of how it unfolded, you know. Are you ever afraid of getting pigeonholed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, 100%. That was a big problem for me back then, um, which is why I just kept hopping around from genre to genre, and I still do, honestly. Um, I think it's like this never-ending struggle to find your voice as a producer, and your sound, and to feel comfortable just making whatever you want to make mm -hmm. um, without fear of how you're perceived. Um, I, I let it get to my head so much at certain points over the last 10 years um, that it almost made everything come to a halt completely. Oh, wow. uh, but I mean, like lately I've felt better than I have in years, literally. Um, I've been making tons of music, but I'm just not, <clears throat> I'm not sharing it. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. not posting clips on Instagram. I'm not, I'm just kind of just, I just want to make as much music as I can right now when I'm feeling inspired and just see what happens. You know, like, it may turn out that I need to start a different project because it doesn't sound like Bro Safari. But then the other side of me is like, well, Bro Safari sounds like Bro Safari. Mm -hmm. So who cares if it's, you know, a, a weird, glitchy, down tempo track or a, like a banger dubstep track or a trap tune or a drum and bass song you know it's like i feel like it should be just whatever comes out naturally so that's kind of like where i'm taking it right now is just make what i want to make and not fit overthink it you know how do you balance that with trends though because medium is so like trend driven i feel i've kind of tuned out from social media mm. and i think with that it blinds me to a lot of the trends um obviously like i'm out djing and stuff so i hear a lot of what's popular and what's getting a response but i'm it's easier for me now than say like four or five years ago to block it out um i just i've just learned 
over the years that it's you you have you can't compare yourself to other people. It's like a, it's so detrimental to everything that it is to be an artist. You know, to be somebody that creates. Um, if you pay attention to what other people are doing and compare yourself in any form or fashion, it just starts to crumble. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it sounds pretty dark, but <laughs> it's true though, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, between tuning out on social media and just not caring in general, it's pretty easy, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Mm-hmm. How did you find or meet Dion Timmer? Because you're one of the yeah. early people who found him, right? Uh, no, I wouldn't say I found him at all. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly. I'm pretty sure I just reached out to him though on Twitter. I think I started following him and just sent him a DM. I was like, I love your stuff, dude. Yeah. I mean, for me, that's a, this is an interesting thing to talk about because there's the difference between, you know, Brosafari the DJ and Brosafari the producer. I have so many songs and I play like a small percentage of them when I DJ because I don't feel like they represent what I want out of a crowd. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. when I'm DJing, I, I really like to get them riled up and a lot of the stuff that I've, I've made is not really like dance floor banger kind of stuff mm. so that being said when I'm <clears throat> looking for new music to DJ I find a lot of you know younger guys that are newer to the scene like like he was at the time and yeah forge friendships and even work on music like with Dion you mm-hmm. know, want to make them proper together what was it like going on tour with Skrillex uh, amazing experience. At the time, it was totally unexpected, and it was it was awesome. The, his crew, they were so accommodating and nice. And I was on the tour with with Valentino Khan. Okay. And he and I were already friends, and we were both kind of like, holy shit, like we're on tour with Skrillex. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, you know, being on a bus doing that whole thing and like I said they were all so nice like I can't stress that enough like all everybody in his crew and it, obviously him too it was great like basically it was just a, like everybody just running around working on music on different computers mm-hmm. they had turntables set up behind stage before every show there was food everywhere you know what I mean like it was it was literally just a place for everybody to thrive and create while playing shows um, I did a tour after that where I did the same thing where I brought, I made sure they had turntables backstage, like in the dressing room for us, because it just created this like vibe in the back. Like everybody wanted to run back and play and just be, you know, messing around and hanging out together as opposed to just sitting on the bus watching TV, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I learned a lot on that tour, honestly, because it was not too long after that tour that I started doing my own bus tours and things. So I kind of like, I took my cues from that and like how to conduct myself because you know if you're the headliner on a tour that's on that scale people look to you as being like you know the leader and I was not comfortable with it or prepared for it necessarily but I like looked back on my time on tour with him and just been like just be laid back as much as possible which I'm sure I wasn't <laughs> I'm not a very laid back person but you know yeah, it was, it was a huge learning experience overall. Mm-hmm. This is something I'll ask Slaidback Luke and a bunch of people who have been doing EDM for a long time, but how do you think it's changed and where do you see it going? Dude, it's, I, it's, there's, there's nothing similar uh, with, with EDM. I mean, it wasn't called EDM. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was all club-based. Festivals weren't a big thing back then. Uh, that's a huge... That's a great starting point, at least. Um, <clears throat> social media changed it drastically. You know, it became more about numbers and yeah. follower accounts and things like that. Which, when I started producing, it was literally if you didn't know what you were doing, like that was it. You know, you had to wait until you were good at what you were doing before people would give you the time of day. Whether it was a promoter, a listener, um, a crowd. <laughs> Uh, you had to bring something to the table. You know what I mean? Like it was, it's, it was just way different. And I'm not saying people don't bring something to the table now, but it was just that was the only deciding factor back then. It's like, do you have the skills either as a DJ or a producer that plays your own music, 
no, then what are you doing here? You know, like, there was no memes to post, like, to get a ton of likes or whatever. So that's another huge difference, social media. Yeah. Um, yeah, and again, the festival thing is a huge difference, too, because, like, that's how a lot of people find out about this type of music, is because their friends are going to festivals, and they see that, like, oh, I'm just running around in a field with my friends dancing, like, that looks like fun, especially when you're, you know, 16, 17, 18, whatever. So, I mean, that had a huge impact on how people view the music, you know? And then that brought money. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like festivals and things like that brought tons of more money into the scene, which always complicates things, you know? Mm -hmm. But all that being said, those are the obvious differences, but it's obviously in a better place now. Overall, I mean, it's huge. Everybody, you know, my parents now know. When I when I used to make drum and bass, they yeah. thought it was called German bass. <laughs> like, they, they didn't know shit, but now, you know, they know who Skrillex is. Mm -hmm. So it's... <laughs> It's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. How about the future? <laughs> future. You know, I or actually... Or would you like it yeah, to be? <laughs> yeah, no, I actually... I hear it going into a good direction musically, which is what I try to focus on more than anything else, is the actual quality of the music. <laughs> We're in this like little right. photo shoot behind us. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I hear a lot of fusion of genres. Especially, you know, the bass side of things. People are getting weirder, like, with what they're making. You know, stuff that... New sounds, new arrangements. It's not as cookie-cutter as it kind of got for a minute. And if you remember a couple years ago, and it was, like, all hard house. Hard house mixed with trap. Like, yeah. stuff like that. Um, now you got people like Troy Boy. Mm -hmm. That's just one example. You know, guys that came along and kind of said, Yo, it's okay to be different and have your own style and your own sound and so I think there's a lot more kids doing that and kind of just going in that direction and just making weird bass music and for me if that's the way it goes I am all for that because that's what originally got me into bass music in general you know? how would you say you've grown as a person compared to when you were younger <laughs> well I've gone through a lot <laughs> over the last especially 10 years um, there was points where I became really, really cynical. I, you know, depressed. <laughs> Went to many dark places, but right now I feel great. You know, so I think it's just been this like roller coaster ride of emotions. Um, I, when I started doing all this, like I wasn't seeking any attention, and in fact, I really don't like attention. You know. Um, had to do a headline tour because it's what was demanded of me kind of not not by my management I just mean like that's where I was at musically yeah. like I had enough attention to sell out a, a, a big room so we might as well do a tour but I really felt uncomfortable you know I'm an introvert <laughs> I'm a, I don't like being under the big lights and so you know after doing that for a long time I got so burnt out on like literally physically burnt out from touring I was tired all the time. I wasn't home enough. I, you know, I felt like I was missing out on my kid growing up, and it, I became fairly depressed about it, to be honest. And but again, the last six months, four to six months, have been like like a huge resurgence. You know, like in creativity, positivity. Like I see things a little more clearly. Um, and that's due to a lot of different things, you know, like different factors. Obviously all, you know, personal growth and reflection. But, you know, I, I think I went from being a carefree young kid to, you know, going into adulthood, doing things that I didn't necessarily want to be doing. Um, and it really affected me, but I came out of it stronger. Okay. What kind of advice do you have for people who are going through depression or what you went talk through? Talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> talk, to, talk to a therapist. Like, you know, I, I always felt like I was too smart to talk to a therapist. Like, mm -hmm. in my mind, you know, I was like, I, I'm, what am I, you know, I, you're just, it's fear, you know? I think when you're depressed, you don't acknowledge the fears that you're having um, about, and the truths about yourself the negative things about yourself, like it's hard to look at yourself. 
and get give yourself an, a, like a real analysis of what's going on. And I think talking to some people is easily the best way to resolve those things, especially a therapist, somebody who knows what they're doing. That's what I did. And honestly, just the act of going once a week and talking to somebody two times a week and just going and talking to somebody that's not going to judge you can make all the difference. So all of a sudden you start saying things out loud mm-hmm. and you realize this isn't like, I don't like the way I sound. Like, what am I saying right now? Like, I, I, this, I shouldn't feel this way. And then you, you're given the tools to work through it, you know? How has your perspective on life changed after being a dad? Th- that's when everything has happened for me. Mm-hmm. You know, this everything I've been talking about here. Um, because, you know, again, I found out I was having a kid and I had no career. I had nothing going for me. So to have that all happen, like the, the birth and rise of Bro Safari, while I was have you know raising a, a toddler, it was profound. You know, like it, all of these things at once happening, I I stopped thinking about myself a little bit more and my own happiness. I guess it was like okay, well, all of this is for him. All of this is you know it, it's I wasn't giving myself any. <laughs> love and care you know what I mean like I wasn't taking care of myself straight up so all you know it was it, it's it's changed me <laughs> so much I can't even begin to, to explain you know if I could find a video of me you know two years before he was born I was a completely different person wow. yeah I was reckless drank a lot um, I was you know I was, I was out of control <laughs> honestly I was so he really grounded me and centered me and then I had to go through my own thing to kind of like, it, it's something about having a kid just changes your perspective on mortality, you know, <laughs> like not to get too deep, but I, I was forced to confront those fears, you know, of being inadequate, of not leaving behind a, a legacy for my child, money, you know, real life shit. Mm-hmm. What does love mean to you? What does love mean to me? Acceptance, tolerance. Um, you know, I immediately started that thought of Heather and Elliot. Elliot's my son. There's just a complete and total acceptance of <laughs> how we are as people, you know? Nobody's perfect. You learn to not only accept, but admire people's bad qualities in a sense, you know? Like, it sounds a little stupid, but I, I, I just, uh, I'm having a hard time articulating this because nobody's ever asked me that. <laughs> what do you love about your wife's personality? She's like, <laughs> she's such a, a rebel, like underneath <laughs> everything that she's become. Like when I met her, we were both just wild as hell. Like we we're partying like crazy. She's just feisty, <laughs> you know, she's so feisty, but in a loving way, you know, like you can't bullshit her, so. She knows what I'm thinking. I know what she's thinking. We just, you know, once once you've been together in such an intimate setting for so long, raising a kid, living together, there's just so many unspoken things that start to happen. And I love that. I, I think it's great. Like we don't, you know, we went through our periods of like bickering and fighting. And then we, I think we both just kind of realized that it was pointless. So we don't really even fight. We don't argue. It's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I need to point out that it's probably because she accepts me for who I am, and it's mm. not because I have plenty of you know annoying traits as a as a hubby, as somebody that you know to live with. I don't pick up after myself enough, you know, like yeah. all the basic stuff that guys do. Last question: What do you want to be remembered for? Well, I think I think I'm working on that right now, musically. I think if you're asking like. How do I want to be remembered by my my son versus somebody watching this? Mm -hmm. There's different answers. You know what I mean? Yeah. So as far as somebody watching this, you know, I... I, Somebody who kept it real with myself when it came to the music that I wanted to make. Right now, I'm working on so much different stuff that I, I have a vision somewhat of an EP, an album, but I really want to put out the best work of my life. And I want it to be, 
I want people to realize it when they listen to it, say, wow, he really went out on a limb here and I hope it translates. And I hope that that's the type of thing that I'm remembered for is, you know, pioneer maybe, risk taker, mm -hmm. somebody yeah. who's been around and survived the, you know, rise and fall of multiple genres and still still around like I'm, people are still booking me you know like i've been there ups and downs I'm like a, i'm like the cockroach of edm <laughs> no far from it oh my god this is so much fun though thank you so much for sharing everything yeah dude of course bad blast sorry i'm all winded no worries <laughs>